Okay, so we made it to the end of psychology. Today's the last lecture on the kind of psychological material that we've been dealing with. We're gonna have the test on Thursday, obviously, and then after that, we're gonna move on to AI. Uh, so enjoy this, the last day that we're gonna be talking directly about psychology as our main topic. Uh, any kind of course business questions before we get going? Any broader questions about like material and stuff like that? Okay, okay, so let's dive in. So to review where we're at. Uh, so we've been talking about insight because we were hoping to understand problem solving, to understand cognition. And what we found when we studied problem solving was that insight is the hardest part of it. Insight problem solving seems to be the human kind of problem solving. I wanna emphasize that this is not a case, it's not the case that uh, all problems that we face require insight. There's lots and lots of problems that you can, for example, program a computer to solve. If you know what the right operators are and how to use those operators, you can mechanically solve lots of problems. And that's good, you wanna be able to mechanically solve a lot of your problems so you don't have to think about it and use up your precious cognitive resources. Um, but if we're gonna have a theory of human intelligence, we do do this insight stuff, so we need to understand how we do insight. Uh, and maybe if we understand insight, that'll help us understand problem solving and that'll help us understand cognition. So that's the, that's the hope. Now we went through two different theories of insight, uh, search inference and gestalt. I won't kind of uh, belabor this because we went over it last time again and we went it over the time before last in detail and then we reviewed it last time. So hopefully this is sort of settling in. What we saw last time was that the search inference people uh, kind of gave up on their idea that there's no such thing as insight problem solving. So that was the, that was the movement in the discussion that we saw last time. Originally, they were saying, look, there's just no difference, no difference at all between insight problem solving and regular problem solving. They're both just searches through the space of your memory where you find some solution and then apply it to the problem. So they kind of gave up on that. They kind of admitted uh, in the late 80s to 90s that there really is something to explain here. Uh, and then they proposed a kind of you know, it's an extension of the original theory. So they admitted that they need to extend their theory. Uh, they decided that they would talk about a meta-level search. So not just search through a single space, but search through, so what you do when you're trying to solve a problem that turns out to be an insight problem, you search through the regular search space, you fail, and then you move up a level to a kind of space of search, uh, space of problem formulations. You start searching through a space of different ways of representing the problem. So, and they, they had hoped, of course, that their basic framework could stay in, stay in uh, uh, place with just some, a little bit of added machinery. And we talked about the added machinery that they thought would make sense in this context. So when you shift up from the regular search space, searching this problem space to the meta space, they proposed a new heuristic. So remember that the original Kaplan and si or Newell and Simon thing was means ends heuristic. At the meta level, they think there's a different heuristic doing most of the work, which is the notice and variance heuristic. And we criticize that, uh, finding that we didn't know which invariance to notice. That wasn't a complete story about how we do it. Uh, and that uh, it wasn't clear how, even once you've noticed the, invari the relevant invariances in your failures, how you leverage that into a solution. Because just knowing how you fail isn't the complete story about how you're gonna succeed. So, I hope I was at least mildly sympathetic to this view that there's two different kinds of processes going on in insight problem solving. So I think in the roughest outline, this has got something going for it, which is that there's a shift in the style of problem solving that you do when you're trying to do insight problem solving. And we talked a little bit about how you can actually see this going on in the brain. If you stick somebody in a brain scanner while they're doing an insight problem, you can actually see how in the standard, you know, within a problem space, working on a problem, you're mostly left-brained, you're mostly doing inferences and analysis and using logic and doing step-by-step -step sequential reasoning, which seems to be what the left brain prefers to do in like, I should put a caveat on that, in like 95% of people, it happens in the left. There's some variation on some people do the step-by-step -step stuff in the right side, but anyway, so for most people, the left brain likes to do this step-by-step -step processing. And then when the person has the aha moment that's sort of characteristic of the experience of solving an insight problem, what happens is activity seems to do a dramatic shift into the right hemisphere. 
We talked about how the right hemisphere is preferentially deals with holes, gestalts, the, the, the parallel kind of grasping of the situation as a unified whole, and that that might represent shifting the type of reasoning that you're doing. You are reframing the problem because that gestalt and holistic integration is your problem frame, the framework in which you are trying to solve the problem. When you shift to the right hemisphere, the proposal was, that what you're doing is reframing the problem. You go, aha, I know, that, I know now that I was searching the wrong search space. I was doing the wrong type of inferences. And then you proceed to solve the problem, presumably also in your left hemisphere. So having reframed, you shift back to the left hemisphere and do whatever kind of bits and pieces of that work that you're gonna do. And throughout this, I was trying to make the case that insight problem solving seems to have a profoundly procedural quality. So we talked about the difference between uh, propositional and procedural knowledge, knowing that is propositional knowledge, knowing how is procedural knowledge, skillful knowledge. And I'm trying to make, trying to show you evidence that procedural knowledge seems to be the kind of thing that insight problem solving requires. That is, uh, it's more like having a skill than having a bit of knowledge. And some of the evidence that we saw, like giving people procedural cues, giving them puzzle-based cues, was much more facilitatory of solving insight problems than giving them prop simple propositional cues. Sometimes even the same cue, but you, you offer it to them as a procedural cue. So tell me how to explain this. Give me a, you know, cue the person to try to extract something, skillfully extract a generality from it, rather than trying to memorize it and reproduce it as as exactly as they can. So that was all supposed to be evidence that there's some skills here that are, so insight is a, more like a procedural skill than a sort of propositional inference. Okay, so that's how, that's as far as we got last time. Yeah, questions before we move on? Is it that you're too shy or you just wanna get this over with or what? There's gotta be questions, yeah. Yeah. Or it's everything up until the test, so including this lecture. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? I, I, I find it very doubtful that everybody's just crystal clear on everything that's happening. Yeah. Uh, did we decide if we're going to be at the exam center? Right, so we, we're not going to be here. We're going to be in a different room, and I'll, I, I mentioned it last class. Uh, I'm going to post an announcement after class about the room that we'll be in. So we'll start at 110. I don't want to say it off the top of my head because I'll probably get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. So definitely not here. Definitely not here. Yeah, if you show up here for regular class time tomorrow, you will be sad and disappointed. Okay, Anybody, anything else? Okay, then let's dig in. Okay, so now that we've now that we've kind of got this argument in place that uh, insight is something like a procedural skill, the question is what kind of procedural skill is it? And I want to make the case to you today that it's a skill of modulating your attention. So there's lots of things you can do with your attention other than just uh, pay, like, you don't just sort of like pay attention in a singular easy way. Your attention is actually very complex, very structured, and changing the structure of your attention seems to be crucial to doing insight problem solving. Uh, so we've been talking about an attentional shift, for example, between parts and holes. We've been talking about how uh, in the cat, remember the cat, where you've got ambiguous uh, letters in the middle of both words, and it seems like you need to process the parts in order to get the holes, in order to process the holes in order to get the parts. Recall that bit? Yeah. So doing insight problem solving seems to involve the ability to flexibly and dynamically apply attention to the problem. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear you. Salience. Well, it's a bit reductive to say it's just that, but it's, copy, it's tracking the same basic issues. And as, as I said, this whole class, like from beginning to end, there's a, there's a theme running through it, which is relevance realization. 
So this is once again absolutely still on the question of relevance realization. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, it. I want to quickly recall uh, an issue with uh, insight problem solving that we talked about a few classes ago, which was our worries about verbal overshadowing. So it, there's some, there seems to be uh, some interference between skillful activity and propositional thinking, such that if you ask somebody to explain to, the, to you while they're riding a bike how you ride a bike, it interferes, right? They get less, they're less able to do the thing, the skillful activity, if they're forced to articulate it propositionally. And maybe we were, we were worried a little bit, so at least one researcher talked about verbal overshadowing, which seems to, seems to be the issue that, uh, in fact, if you're doing uh, insight and language are potentially in tension. And I said I'd come back to this, so let's, we're coming back to this. And I wanna make the case that, uh, just really quickly, it doesn't seem to be the case that language itself interferes with insight. So recall this stuff about uh, proposition or procedural cues, right? You can help somebody solve an insight problem if you give them the right type of language. Uh, it seems to be that the, like, recall that the puzzle form of the multiple marriage problem facilitated insight on it. Uh, and you can do both global and local processing on language itself. That's the, the cat thing, right? Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up now is that I think verbal overshadowing is an example of yet another kind of pervasive and very compelling metaphor that I'd like to spend this, most of this class combating. So basically the, the goal of this class is gonna, just like with memory, we talked about the uh, sort of search through a space vision uh, metaphor of memory. It's a kind of intuitive, pre-theoretical uh, metaphor that people like to think about or to sort of think through that you really have to complexify to even begin to deal with the, with the reality, the empirical reality. So the metaphor this time is going to be the spotlight or searchlight metaphor of attention. We're gonna be talking about attention all day today. And here's the metaphor, so here's the metaphor. Uh, you, people like to talk as though attention is like a spotlight. And what it does is when you pay attention to something, it's like a light shining on it and it makes it bright and vivid and somewhat circularly draws your attention to it, right? So it's just a, it's kind of a beam that moves through your experience, all of the possible things, like your, your sense experience is taking in all kinds of things all the time, but your attention is like a spotlight that highlights some of them. So this is, you know, it's a very pervasive metaphor. It's all through our language. Notice the, uh, the connection with phrases like, concentrating, you concentrate the beam of your attention, or focusing, you focus in on something, that's a kind of like, it fits in with this constellation of metaphors that we have about memory. And it's really like, just like with the search space metaphor, it's not that it's completely wrong in every way, and it's not like anybody's defending this as a theoretical account of memory or uh, attention, but it's a metaphor that is the kind of common sense metaphor, and our job is to dig into the common sense metaphors that structure our pre-theoretic understanding of the mind, interrogate them, pull them apart, try to do better than them. So that's, that's the task for today. Okay, so let's dig in. Okay, so uh, I'd like to present to you an argument from a guy called Chris Moll, who wrote a book, he's a philosopher, he wrote a book about attention, Attention is one of those topics that gets uh, covered by both philosophers, psychologists, cognitive scientists. So this is a, this is a, a kind of philosophical analysis of attention. And this is gonna be our first move in pulling apart the spotlight metaphor. So he makes this distinction between direct and indirect actions. So if I say to you, bend your finger, right? You can do that, yeah? Now, what did you do to bend your finger? You just bent it, right? You just do it. It's a direct action. You don't have to do anything to cause your, bent, your finger to bend. You just do it, yeah? And that's what makes it direct. Uh, and I can, you can say things to somebody about direct actions. You can modify the way they do a direct action. So bend your finger faster, bend your finger slower, uh, that kind of thing. Now, 
Contrast that with indirect action. So that's a direct action. You can think of lots of direct actions, right? Things that you do without having to do anything else. Contrast that with indirect actions. So if I say to you, practice, you say, practice what? What do you mean? Like, what is it that you want me to practice? Right? So it's unlike bend your finger, you need something much more specific to say, like, practice. You know how to practice, you practice lots of things. It's not like you don't know how to do this, but it's a modification of something that you're already doing rather than an action that you take directly, right? I can say, practice your handwriting, practice the piano, right? So you modify an activity somehow. Yeah? Well, you'd have to bend, well, it's, it's that you just didn't tell me what to bend. Right, right. I suppose so. So bend is an indirect action then. Yeah. So bend your finger is direct and bend. It's a, sorry, I had a, I had a second to try to process that because it's a weird command, right? That's a really weird thing to say to somebody. You wouldn't do that because it's unspecified. Uh, the argument is that attention is an indirect action. So if I just say to you, pay attention, that's not super clear, is it? Right? You need more information to know what you're going to pay attention to. Uh, so, I mean, usually you mean by, you know, by context, right? So if I'm doing a lecture and you're on your phone and I say, pay attention, you know, just from context, what I want you to pay attention to, but you really need it specified, right? So if you're just sitting, if I, if you're sitting in the library and I walk up to you and say, pay attention, you say, what? To what? Right? So, uh, attention on this, in this argument is supposed to be a kind of, modification of something that you're doing already. What is it a modification of? Well, it's what you're doing with your senses. So your attention acts on your senses, right? Internal, external, you could be paying attention to your thoughts, you could be paying attention to your vision, you could be paying attention to all kinds of things. What you're doing all the time is taking in sensory information and self-generated information. And when you're paying attention, what you're doing is modifying that flow of information. So Mole's uh, proposition for what attention is, is a kind of cognitive unison. That, that is what you're doing when you're paying attention to something is modifying the way you're using your senses to make them co-relevant to a project. What do I mean by that? So what you're doing when you pay attention to something is that you tune your various senses to all extract some kind of information that's relevant to something that you're trying to do. So if, you, if I say, pay attention in a way that helps you find your cat, your cat, suppose your cat's missing, so I say, pay attention, try to find the cat, then what your visual system does is look for cat-shaped objects, your hearing listens for cat-shaped, or cat-shaped, cat-like sounds, right? You, and Recall how much information you're taking in from both of those sensory modalities all the time, right? There's tons of visual information you could be paying attention to, tons of sounds you could be attending to, filtering for. When you're paying attention in the way that you're looking for your cat, what you're doing is saying, I'm going to train my, I'm going to modify the way I'm looking to look for cat-shaped objects, modify the way I'm listening to listen for cat-like sounds, right? And to bring those two together is to pay attention in a particular way. I hope that you are at least somewhat paying attention to me right now. I don't need all your attention. 30, 40% is probably enough. Uh, but that means that you are listening to the sound of my voice, filtering out other sounds. You are looking at me for hand gestures. I'm not sure why that helps, but it does. Uh, and my facial expression, that kind of thing. So you're taking both the, at least two of your senses and making them co-relevant to each other, right? You're making them connect to each other in an important way. Uh, so the point of this example is just to, just to kind of get us started on the question of like, what is attention? How does it work? And also to push back against the spotlight metaphor a little bit. So, uh, the point is that you can shape your attention in a way that you can't, the spotlight metaphor doesn't really bring out, right? Just paying attention to, for example, me, 
It doesn't tell you how you're paying attention to me. So if you are somebody, if you're like a public speaking coach, you're gonna be paying attention to me in a very different way than a student would be paying attention to me. I hope that you are not trying to analyze my ums and uhs and awkward mannerisms. I hope what you're doing is paying attention to me in a way that helps you learn the material, right? So you're shaping your attention in a, because you've got a project in mind, you've got a set of things that are relevant, trying to learn cognitive science. You're paying attention to me in a very specific way. And that doesn't come out if, you're, if, it's, if attention is just a spotlight shining on me, there's no difference between those two things, right? It's unclear how that difference arises. So the spotlight metaphor doesn't really help us. Is that fairly clear? Just trying to add layers to it. Now, you can always, you can always with a metaphor, metaphors are nice because they're vague. Uh, the, the philosopher Feng Yu Lan says there's an inverse relationship between articulateness and suggestiveness. The more articulate something is, the less suggestive the more suggestive, the less articulate. So metaphors are great because they're highly suggestive. You could always sort of like work these ideas back into the metaphor, but just notice that the metaphor itself doesn't give you these things. It doesn't give you the co-relevant, co it doesn't give you attention as cognitive unison, making your senses co-relevant to a project. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. great. <coughs> Well, it's like a, attention is like a filter that you put over your experience to pick out those things that are relevant to your interests. Yeah. 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 Can't you just be using like one sense? You can. You can. So uh, if you're just using, if you're just focused on one sense, you're still typically filtering for something. You're paying attention to something. So imagine listening to music. You can pay attention to just the drums or just the guitar or just the horns or something like that, right? So you're, you're still filtering your experience for something that you find relevant somehow. Uh, does, that, does that work? It doesn't seem like cognitive music. Right, right. Uh, that's, that's probably right. Well, it's, yeah. It's not cognitive unison in the sense of bringing multiple senses together. Because you said earlier that you're thinking about it while you're, like, the, you kind of, I don't know, yeah. like, you, you were talking about how you're thinking about it, not just like, when you're, I don't know. It's okay, that's okay. So, no, no it's a, this is an interesting sort of probe. So, uh, you're bringing at least two things together. Your sense, mo what the, so in the music example, I'm like, I'm really interested in drumming, so I'm just going to listen to the drummer. Uh, you're bringing at least two things together, which is your goals and your senses. So cognitive unison is not necessarily, let's, let's try to help mole out here. Cognitive unison is not necessarily unison amongst various sense modalities. It can be unison amongst just one sense modality and your goals and interests. So you're, bring, you're bringing together what you're trying to get out of the world with your sense modality. Um, it's, it's a better metaphor when there's multiple senses involved, but I think we can salvage something from a single sense modality. Yeah? Yeah? Hmm. The, like the student versus the public speaker, I'm still focusing my spotlight instead of like on you literally as a visual right. Right. stimulus. I'm yeah. paying attention to like important semantic information. Yeah, so we can, you can always, with a metaphor, there, there, there's, this is the vagueness, or suggestiveness, articulateness stuff. It's vague enough that you can always like, once you've figured out something complex and interesting, like, oh look, there's a bunch of layers to attention, you can always import it back into the metaphor. You, you're like, oh no, I'm gonna preserve my metaphor at all costs. And like, now instead of just a spotlight falling on objects, it's a spotlight falling on certain aspects of objects. That's okay, I mean, there's nothing intellectually suspect about that, but there's gonna be, a, well, we'll do a bunch of ways in which the searchlight metaphor kind of just didn't tell us things. That's it, that's it. This is important because we're, the relationship between common sense and theory is a tricky one. You don't, you want to start from common sense. This is, this is a very reasonable place to start. You start from what you assume to be the case and then kind of interrogate it. And it's so long as you get, so long as you get some progress on understanding the phenomenon, it doesn't really matter if the original metaphor collapses or not. Like you're, it's fine to use these metaphors. It's just that 
when we, when we interrogate the metaphors, hopefully we end up with something more complex and articulate than just the spotlight. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think that it can, so the, if the question is, can just our perception drive what's relevant, I don't think that's the case. Uh, asking, but if it's a contributor to what we find relevant, then yeah, for sure, for sure. If like, it's a contributor to what we find relevant, and we're using our relevance to determine or to filter down the search base of what we're looking for to, to get only the relevant thing. Uh -huh. Are we not just using relevance to use relevance to define what is relevant? <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Yeah, so the, the, the case that I'm going to be making in the uh, sort of by the end of this course is that rel assessments of relevance happen at every level of cognition. So every part of your brain is involved in it. Every kind of like even the ultra simple uh, low level processing requires relevance realization and your most abstract high level stuff requires relevance realization. So it's happening at every level. That's that's the idea. So. And maybe I'll give you an argument at the end of this class about how that's possible, or at least the broad outlines of how that's going to be possible. Okay. So are we hap are happy enough with this? I mean, just the idea that, look, your, your attention just doesn't fall on a thing. It falls under a thing under a certain aspect. And often it falls under a thing through multiple sense modalities and that kind of thing. So that's just a complexification of the searchlight metaphor. Okay. Let's do another complexification. So have you ever noticed how your attention is layered? So uh, this is an activity that I'd like you to participate in. So what, what you need are an object and a pen or a pencil or something that you can tap with. So I'm going to use my, I got a USB stick in my case here. So everybody get, a, get an object and a thing that you can tap with, that you don't mind tapping away at it. Come on, come on, come on. Do this. We're gonna we're gonna do an intentional exercise here. Okay, so when I say go, don't start yet. But when I say go, I want you to start tapping on the object. Sort of close your eyes and start tapping on the object, and pretend you don't know what shape the object is. Pretend you don't know what shape it is, and what you're trying to do with this is going to be your probe. Whatever you've got in your hand is your probe. You're trying to understand the shape and density and everything of the object. So you're using this thing to try to investigate this thing. Your probe is trying to investigate this. Okay, so when I say go, we're going to start doing that. I'm going to give you, keep going. I'm going to give you further instructions as we go along, but try to do this. Pretend you don't know what this object is shaped. Your brain, your brain doesn't know that you know what the shape of the object is. So this will, I promise you this will work. You can kind of investigate the object. Okay, so give it a shot. Try this. No? So you're investigating your object with your probe. Yeah? Okay. So you can kind of get a sense of the object. You can feel its rough shape. You can feel how hard it is, maybe how dense it is. Yeah? Okay. Now what I want you to do is shift your attention into your probe. So feel the probe rather than the object. Feel the pen or pencil in your hand. Okay, so now instead of feeling the object, you're feeling your pen or pencil. Okay, now shift your attention into your fingers. Rather than feel your probe, feel the jiggle on your fingers. Oh, yeah? Okay, now shift back into the probe. Feel the probe. Now shift back into the object. Feel the object through the probe. Okay, okay, that's it. Okay, so what was the point of that? Uh, one thing that i just like you to notice is that your attention has layers. Your attention is not just monolithic. It's not just sensations, and I'm paying attention to those sensations. So throughout those three conditions, right, you're, paying att you're either paying attention through the probe to the object, or you're paying attention to the probe or you're paying attention to the sensations in your fingertips, it's all the same sensations, right? You don't literally feel the 
through the, per like you don't literally use whatever you're tapping with to feel the object. You don't have any sensations through the pen. It's all just sensations in your fingertips, right? But what you're doing is modulating your attention to focus on different aspects of your experience. Specifically, what you're doing is, I would say, the following. You're, you're modulating between what uh, Michael Planier calls subsidiary awareness or focal awareness. So a really helpful metaphor, and I think I used this once before, I usually pay attention, I visually, is a, here's a visual metaphor. I pay attention through my glasses. I'm looking through my glasses at you. That's, uh, so my glasses provide a kind of window for my attention. Sometimes, particularly when they're dirty, I want to look at my glasses. So rather than uh, being the object of subsidiary awareness, they are the object of focal awareness. Typically when I want to clean them, when I want to improve them, so I can have a better view through them. So uh, attention has a kind of of through structure. You can either be aware of something or you can be aware through something. So when you are tapping, using the probe to tap the object, you're aware through the probe of the object. Or when you're paying attention to the probe, you're aware through your sensations of the probe. And you can do this on multiple levels. So like, I hope that you have the experience of seeing me in front of you in the classroom, but you're really just experiencing a bunch of chemical signals in your retinas, aren't you? Like those are just nerve activations in your retina. What you do is look through those sensations to the world. And that's good because what you want most of the time is a model of the world. You can do the opposite though. You can decide to not look through your sensations, but at them, right? You can modulate your attention. So instead of looking through, you're paying attention to your sensations as sensations. Uh, and you do this kind of flexibly, dynamically. I hope nobody, I hope that, that for most of you, that extra, that weird little exercise we just did was not too, like amazingly taxing. You're able to do this, right? You're at least some way, and maybe not you didn't have a super vivid experience of it, but you had some experience of being able to shift your attention either through the probe or at the probe or at your fingertips, something like that, yeah? Right, and where your, where your focal attention is and what counts as subsidiary attention will depend on what you're trying to do, what your goals are, what your interests are. Again, this is something that like really doesn't come through the search or the searchlight metaphor, right? Really unclear. Okay, so let me just give you another way of speaking about the same thing. So that we I've just been talking about subsidiary awareness, focal awareness. Uh, here's another guy who talks about the exact same thing in slightly different language that I think is a little clearer. So Thomas Metzinger, who's a philosopher slash cognitive scientist, talks about transparency opacity shifts. This is the language I'm gonna use for the rest of the lecture, transparency opacity. So uh, you can either look through something, in which case it's transparent, like I'm looking through my transparent glasses, or you can look at it. Yeah? Okay. Now, think about problem formulation. So when you're, usually when you're in an non-insight problem, you're looking through your problem formulation. Remember when you tried to do the nine dot problem first, right? You're just like, I know what kind of problem this is. It's a connect the dots problem, right? You're looking through it. Your problem formulation does not appear to you as an object of attention, right? Your problem formulation is automatic, unconscious, mostly the way that you want it. You want problems to just appear to you formulated so you can attempt to solve them, right? That's what you want most of the time, unless of course you're in an insight problem. If you're in an insight problem, your problem formulation is frustrating your attempts to solve the problem. And then you have to do what Metzinger calls an, a transparency opacity shift. Instead of looking through your problem formulation, you have to shift your attention to look at your problem formulation. Yeah. You have to change the way that you're paying attention to the problem. 
so that you can reformulate it in a way that's solvable. So. And once again, very unclear how we're going to cash this out in the search, search light spotlight metaphor. Yeah? I, I don't, I can't think of a way to make this work with the metaphor, so. So, is it clear to you what's going on here? Like, that your tension has, it's got a layered structure, and those layers are layers of transparency and opacity. What you were doing when you were doing the tapping exercise was first letting your sensations in your fingertips be transparent and your impression of the probe be transparent. You were looking through them at the object. And then you shifted to making the, op the probe opaque and then you shifted to making your finger experience in your fingertips opaque. Yeah? Okay, so this is the layered structure of attention that there's this transparency opacity thing. Okay, questions before we move on with this stuff? Okay, and is it, is it clear how this relates to the, at least the problem solving problem formulation thing? Like almost all of your experience, you want it to be transparent, except when you need it not to be. Um, one of my favorite exchanges one of my favorite lines from this bizarre philosopher Slavoj Žižek, you know this guy? So he talks about, um, uh, in the run-up to the Iraq war, Dick Cheney says there are known, Dick Cheney, the Minister of Defense at the time, says there are known knowns, things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns, things that we know that we don't know. And there are unknown unknowns, things that we don't know that we don't know. And Žižek says, yeah, that's right, but you forgot one thing. Unknown knowns. Things that you know that you don't know that you know. And he says that's ideology. So you've got all of these things that you know that you don't know that you know. That's because they are transparent. You are looking through them at the world. You've framed the world in various ways. And again, you wanna be doing that almost all the time because the world is so unimaginably complex that if you don't put a frame around it, you'll never be able to cope with it. But what you also want to be doing, and this is the lesson of insight problem solving, what you need in order to be a human level intelligence is the capacity to sometimes interrogate the frame to make it shift from being transparent to opaque, which is why you should do philosophy. Okay. Okay. So that's one, le one way in which attention seems to be structured in a deep way that doesn't get cashed out by the spotlight metaphor. Let me do another. So here's a, here's a kind of uh, par or orthogonal way, a, a way that's sort of uh, not unrelated, but construal level. So we've been talking about this, right? We've been talking about this a lot last lecture. It's separate from, but often related to, you often do these in a coordinated fashion. Construal levels refers to whether you're seeing the parts or the holes. Call with Navon letters, right? You can either see the top left thing there as an E or as a bunch of A's. That's construal, the, the level at which you're, which you're construing it is whether you got it as a whole or as parts. So, uh, Another thing that you can do with your attention is either pay attention to the whole, pay attention to the parts. And we talked about last time how it looks like insight problem solving involves shifting between one or the other, right? You could, you could facilitate insight by causing people to shift from one level to the other. Okay, so let me just put this on a graph for you. So on one on one axis, we've got construal level. Uh, that is whether you're looking at the parts or the holes. And on the vertical axis, we've got transparency opacity, whether you're seeing something transparently or opaquely. This is a weird graph. Don't, I mean, maybe don't take this too seriously as like a Cartesian graph, but I just wanna get this as the fact that these are two different directions in which you can move, two different directions in which your attention can shift, right? With the same object of attention, 
you can either go from seeing the parts transparently, you're seeing through the parts, or seeing the parts opaquely. You are seeing, you're paying attention to the parts. Or same thing with the holes. And you can do the same thing with a construal level. You are either looking at an opaque hole, or now you're looking at opaque parts. You're looking at the hole, you're looking at the parts, or you're seeing through the hole, or you're seeing through the parts. And the case I'm gonna make for you today is that the ability to solve insight problems involves shifting around these two dimensions in a flexible, dynamic, and appropriate way. Yeah? So when you're solving an insight problem, what you're doing is moving in one or two of these directions at the, at the same time. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. This is just like the structure of attention, right? Even looking at the same object, you can have at least two dimensions of difference in how you're paying attention to the thing. So when I'm talking about flexibly shaping your attention, I'm basically talking about it in terms of moving in one or the other directions or both in changing the way that you're paying attention to something. Yeah? Can they be like the same thing? Well, I see, I see, so they're very often, uh, I, don't, I, I would insist that they're not exactly the same thing, but they can happen in a coordinated fashion. So you can shift from uh, seeing transparent parts to seeing opaque holes. So you're not looking at the parts, uh, you're just sort of seeing through them, but then you shift to seeing, looking at the whole thing. Uh, so this is perhaps what happens when so the, from going from the top left to the bottom right is perhaps what happens when you recall the nine dot problem, you're seeing it as within a box. So the parts of the thing are transparent to you. And then when you get the aha moment, you shifted both from looking at it in terms of its parts to looking at the whole thing. And you turn those parts into a, a thing, a hole that you're looking at. So, Doing these bo both shifts in a coordinated fashion is probably going to be involved in complex insight problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of confused. Basically, what you're saying is what you're shifting between how you use your attention. That's right. That's right. So these are two different dimensions in which your attention can shift. Even keeping it on the same, like it's the same basic thing that you're looking at but you can change the way you can either do a transparency opacity shift or a shift from looking at the parts to looking at the whole and you can do them both at once, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is kind of like using my phone. Hello. Uh, yeah. Using my holes to create parts to create new holes from like Yeah, Does yeah. That sounds a lot like just helping though. Know, like it should, it should sound like consulting. This is, I spent all that time talking about consulting so you'd have the, backup or the background to understand this. You're getting it. Don't, don't sound distressed. You're getting it. These all just seem like redefinitions of each other. Well, they're deeply related concepts. They are deeply related concepts. That's part of it. Is I'm, I hope I'm not just offering you a whole bunch of random unrelated things. This is supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a continuous narrative. It all fits together into an argument. That's the, that's the goal. So I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to hear that, that you're seeing connections between things. <laughs> okay, yeah. Can you just what the means to be transparent and opaque? Yeah, yeah, so uh, to, be to be transparent is to look through a thing, right? So you're uh, trying to come up with good examples. So when I'm looking, I mean, there's the literal sense of like looking through my glasses, looking at my glasses, yeah? Okay, that didn't help. Okay, so uh, this was the exercise. So did the tapping thing help? So I'm, I'm looking through the sensations in my fingers. I'm using them as a proxy to gain information about what the shape of the thing is. So I'm looking through my sensations in the sense of trying to uh, use them to get to something further away than the sensations. Yeah, I'm trying to like, 
So the fact is that you're hearing my voice right now, but what's actually happening is that there's a, you, the, some small bones in your ears are vibrating. And I take it that you don't experience my voice as small bones in your ears vibrating. That's because you're seeing through your, the vibrating experience in your ears, seeing in a metaphorical sense, and using it to gain information about something else. Got it? Is that good? Okay, good. All right. All right. So, attention seems to be like the, the, the tool that we, that, we, that we use to, to help us achieve our goals. Right? But the way that we use it, attention is by like, allowing us to, to focus on relevant information. So, if you're in an environment, mm. there's maybe an internet or not, possible stimuli. Mm -hmm. Attention. Your goal helps you guide attention yep. to what is specifically important or what's relevant. Yeah. My question would be like, how? How? <laughs> but that seem, like the goal. How? How would the goal? Like how would attention translate? How would that translate into you knowing what to exactly focus on? Mm. Right. So. To use the example of you talking, yep. eardrums, yep. millions of bones in your eardrums vibrating. Yep. I'm able to, to determine that this is a specific meaning from the words that you're saying. Yep. Right? But how is that simply because of attention? Like it's like attention, it seems to be right. the tool and the, the, the cause of this word. So I, I, okay, so I think, I don't think that attention is going to be the whole story about how we decide what's relevant. Um, attention is how you navigate the possible information that you have, but you all, you need some sense of what you're looking for, right? So it could easily be the case. And I think it probably is the case that your sense of what's important comes from something other than just sensory attention. Yeah. Like, notice that you've got some values built right into your core of, the, of your being, right? Uh, I think I used this in our discussion after class. Uh, I got a real thing for having oxygen, steady supply for oxygen. I don't know if anybody else feels this. If you try to take my oxygen away, I get really upset. I get, I'll thrash around, I'll make weird noises. I really, really love my oxygen. So that's a thing that my brain is like, this is really relevant. And I don't think that's got anything to do with how I'm paying attention to the world. In fact, if you try to take my oxygen away, it doesn't really matter what I previously thought was relevant. That's going to become the most relevant thing to me. My attention is going to be entirely focused on that. So there's some built-in stuff about what's important to you that doesn't seem to require... You don't explain that in terms of attention. You explain attention in terms of that. Okay. Does that... So, like, when describing... Like, when, when deciding whether to use, like, to, to be transparent or to, yep. to view... Yeah. That's that's not automatic. That's being guided by your goals, right? Um, so it can be unconscious, but you can also consciously alter it, um, and it does it does seem to have a bearing on on your goals, or it's, sorry, your goals seem to determine what makes sense in terms of when you should shift from one to the other. Okay, so it'd be like your breathing is automatic, but you can choose to hold your breath. Exactly. Exactly. So you can voluntarily, so the exercise with the tapping thing was voluntarily shifting transparency opacity levels. Uh, typically that happens unconsciously. You don't want to have to be doing that consciously all the time. In fact, it's really hard to do it consciously for any sustained amount of time. It's, that's uh, what you do uh, typically in meditation practice. And it takes a lot of training to do that. So I, I would say that almost all the time, transparency opacity shifts just kind of happen to you. Um, but you can do it consciously. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think like a helpful metaphor would be like driving a car. Right. Because uh, when you're... you're driving a car, you start off, but you don't know how to know. You pay attention to everything. Yeah. And that would be like capacity, uh, everything. Everything is everything opaque. Everything comes into your mind. Yeah, yeah. As you understand it more, yeah. you use the car as more of a, a transparent and use it as a tool yeah. Good. to navigate the yeah, and this is, this is actually fairly typical of skill building. When you're starting out, tons and tons of stuff is opaque to you, and then you can slowly use it transparently. Like, I can imagine getting so good at chess that I could tell the mood of the person I'm playing with just by the moves that they make. So in that sense, you're using, instead of looking at the moves, you're looking through the moves to the person. 
Yeah. So aren't you always looking at something opaquely? So in your yeah. example, you're looking at her um, emotions yeah. opaquely. Yeah. So isn't it kind of more like the layers of transparency then? That makes sense, yeah. So I think they're, they're always, well, oh, okay, so. I'll do another example. Yeah, like, no, yeah, yeah, I think there's always, there's always something opaque. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 I think that's right. I think that's right. There's always some, there's always some terminating point. Yeah. So when you're uh, speaking to me, I'm looking through the sounds yeah. and like the syntax yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And you, sorry, another example of transparency opacity. You can listen to the sound of my voice in the sense of the, the sonic qualities of it. Is this person's voice high or low? Is it grumbly? Is it clear? And typically in a classroom situation, that's not your goal. You're not my sound, you're not my vocal coach. You're trying to learn from me. So you're like listening through the sound of my voice and its sonic quality to the meaning, to the words, looking through the words to the meaning. That's the standard thing that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a quick question about like, the mind and sure. the layering and stuff. Um, okay. Like, with the transparency and opacity. Um, if somebody was in a situation of trauma, yeah. their adrenaline spikes, and thus they don't feel the pain immediately, yeah. Yeah. so they can see their injuries as, an, as uh, are they seeing it as opaque, or are they seeing it as transparent? And once the um, adrenaline Falls, yeah. Is they're no, like assume that they're no longer conscious. Um, when the adrenaline falls, their body is now susceptible to the pain from the trauma. So is that transparent or or opaque? And um, since they're not conscious and they don't have control over it, yeah. is it really the us who are making the decisions, or is it our mind that can make the conscious as well? Right. Right. Um. Good question. It's, that's a good question. It's a tricky question. Let me think. Let me think for a sec. So I'm tempted to say that uh, because what an adrenaline spike does is reduce your sensory experience of pain, this is a whole, that's all. It's kind of a separate uh, quality. So what it's doing, what your body is doing for you when you experience some. I go into shock really, really easily. I'm I'm such a wimp about going to shock. I get a little cut. And I'm like, ooh. So what my body's trying to do for me is uh, same if I see blood, I would not make it in the battlefield. If I see blood, I get woozy. So uh, what my body's doing for me is trying to protect me from the, from the pain, right? It's trying to keep me from experiencing the pain. Uh, and that's kind of just blocking a sensory experience. So even if you paid attention to the pain, in my experience, it's just kind of not there in the same way that if you, if you had an anesthetic, it's just kind of not there in your sensory experience. So even if you directed your attention to it, it's in some sense muted. Uh, so that's different than a transparency opacity shift in the same way that like if I put in earplugs and just can't hear sound at all, that's different than having a transparency opacity shift because it's just like a, a change in the raw sensory data that's available to your brain, I think. Um, to your, the second half of your question, uh, if you're unconscious, I take it you're not, unless you're having a dream, which I consider kind of a consciousness, a kind of conscious experience. If you're totally unconscious, then you're not really paying attention to anything. So. Attention is a conscious experience. It's a way of modulating your conscious experience. So if you're unconscious, there's none of none of this is even going on. That's what I would. That's what I suggest. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. I'm less confident about the first thing I said than the second thing. So there might be a way of thinking about that in terms of transparency opacity, but that's my that's my best shot at it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm in, say, a sensory deprivation chamber, yep. and I'm not getting any sensory information, how am I getting the sensory information to determine that I'm not getting any sensory information? So, uh, sensory deprivation chamber, or... How, how am I guiding my attention in such a way that I know that there's nothing to guide my attention on? Um, I would suggest that you're still getting... so. Even in the absence of external stimulation, you're generating all kinds of endogenous signals, signals from within. That's so, the hard coded kind of rules that you explain kind of the, the uh, well, sort of, but your your endogenous state can vary dramatically, right? So the 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 inner experience of just having a body absent sensory experience can change quite quite a lot depending on what's going on inside of you. So it's hard-coded makes it sound like it's fixed. 
you're, you're inner, you got lots of inner sensory experience that you can attend to. In a sensory deprivation chamber, they don't take that away. Like you can still feel your own breath. You can hear your own heartbeat. Uh, you can feel your own heartbeat. I assume, I've never been in a sensory deprivation chamber. I assume it's a lot like doing meditation. Uh huh. I think that. Uh, I think that one goes beyond my. I don't really know what it's like to be in a fully paralyzed situation. So, um, I guess relative to your expectations and experiences. So if I'm, you can you can if you. Uh, Give somebody a drug called curare, you can temporarily paralyze them. So they're having no sensory experience from their body. Uh, you would be able to notice that, hey, look, this is real different from when I used to be able to feel my arms and legs. I remember being able to feel my arms and legs. That's gone now. I think that's how you would, I think comparison to past sensory experiences. Uh, well, it's a, it's a collection of data that you have. I mean, you know, like imagine you're watching TV and then the TV goes out and you're like, what's happening? Where is my TV signal? That's a kind of information. Like when it, when it stops, that's like, oh, huh. Uh, just talking really, we'll move on to some examples very soon. We'll, just talking very briefly about this graph. This is indeed a confusing graph. It's not a Cartesian graph in the sense that, uh, so this was pointed out during the break, you can have both opaque parts and transparent holes at the same time. So you don't have to be at one point in this graph at a given time. You're not like moving, you're not a point moving around it. You can be at several places. The point is just that you can have two different shifts in the, the way that you're paying attention. I don't know how to make a better graph. That's the main problem. If anybody can suggest how I can make a superior graph to this, I'm all ears. I just don't know how. So, especially within PowerPoint, it's not a great graph making program. Okay. Okay, so this is a weird, confusing graph. The thing that I want you to take away from it is that there's two kinds of attentional shifts that you can do from opaque to transparent and from parts to holes. Yeah? Yeah. So do you substitute transparency for uh, levels of analysis? Uh, for levels of, I guess, what, what do you mean by levels of analysis? I usually would have thought of construal level as levels of analysis. Okay, so the, the example I was giving, like, you're, when I'm listening to you speak, I'm looking at the sounds transparently. I'm looking through all these things yep. transparently through a, like a, a number of lenses or levels of analysis. And uh, at the end, uh, there's an opaque end. OK. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds reasonable. I guess le level of analysis is just a little, it's a, unless you say what you mean, it's a little ambiguous. So uh, if, that, if that's what you mean, then that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. OK. So now I'm just going to do a bunch of examples of how the kinds of shift, attentional shifts that you need to do, like to go from transparent to opaque, framing and reframing are relevant to insight problem solving. So here's an example. Uh, this was specifically designed to test people's ability to do what's called breaking frame. Your frame is your way of gestalting a situation. So one of those cards is not like the others. Da, 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 da. One of those cards is real weird. <laughs> Which one? Nine. Yep. Four because it's even. There's four because it's even. Well, uh, the black four of hearts. Sorry, I, this, I disappointed everybody who got this. Okay, so uh, black four of hearts. That's not right, right? Unless you play cards, this is not a task that you'd be interested in. But uh, so here's the, here's the kind of uh, experiment that they did. And, what you did when you saw the black four of hearts, you're like, ah, it's the right number of dots, it's the right shape, no problem. You, you put it together as a gestalt. So they gave people the following task. They showed them kind of rapid fire a bunch of cards, some of which made a bunch of sense, made perfect sense. Black five of spades, no problem. Uh, red nine of hearts, no problem. Uh, and they had them try to detect whether there was a problem in the cards. And this is a, what, they, what their hypothesis was was that this would track your ability to break frame. That is, you put the card together as a whole into a meaningful whole for yourself, 
but sometimes you have to break down meaningful holes into their parts. It's a construal level shift, right? Instead of having it an integrated information, you deintegrate your information and look at it in terms of its parts. And so what they did, this is again the individual differences methodology, they tried, they tested people on this task, show them a bunch of cards, test how good they are at detecting the anomalous cards, the cards that like the black four of hearts don't make, don't make any sense. And then they gave them some insight problems and saw whether, tried to see whether the ability to break frame would track the ability to solve insight problems. And it did. So breaking frame, construal level shift from parts, from whole to parts, right? You, you gestalt these really fast. If you, if you played cards all your life, you look at this nine of hearts and you just, all of it fits together, right? Right number of dots, right color, right shape. They all kind of come together as a, un, a meaningful unit. You don't have to say, okay, well, it's a nine. Yeah. And then there's hearts. Okay. Like this is not a deep inferential process that you go through. You just perceptually bring them together as a whole. And sometimes that's real. I mean, usually that's a really good thing to do, right? Gestalting things quickly, unconsciously, without picking them apart into their parts. Usually that's what you want to do because you don't want to have to go, okay, it's got a back and a flat part and some legs. Guess that's probably a chair. Okay. This one back, flat part, legs. Okay. Probably a chair. Like you don't want to do that every time you walk into a room, right? You want your world to be perceptually composed of whole objects that themselves compose a whole scene. You want that to be transparent and quick, automatic, unconscious, uh, until you hit an insight problem like the nine dot problem or the mutilated chessboard problem or the dunker radiation problem. Then that automatic way of putting things together into holes is what gets you trapped in an, a bad problem formulation. Then you need the skill of breaking out of your frame. That's what, that's what helps you break out of an inappropriate problem formulation and help you find the solution. So they tested, this is, this is not really an insight problem in and of itself. This is just, can you pull information that is automatically integrated? Usually you integrate this information automatically. Can you pull it apart into its parts and break frame? And that seems to be correlated with insight problem solving. Yeah. I didn't follow that sentence. So, if, if we want to be able to compose things like your hierarchy of the room of chairs and the room of legs, and then uh -huh. the room, and there's many chairs in the room, that, that's kind of like a form of compositionality. I'm, oh, okay, sorry. You're using compositionality in a different way that I'm used to. Yeah. Okay. Um, am I, is this is kind of the mental check of like when I should give up with how I'm categorizing or organizing my information and try to organize it differently? So some, yeah, something like that. This is a check. So the, the anomalous card task is a test of your ability to uh, detect that the parts don't fit together in the usual way. Uh, so it's not a giving up or uh, not giving up question. It's more like it's, a, it's your ability to unpack the information that usually comes automatically integrated. So either you're integrating this information automatically or you're not. And your ability to de-automatize that in integration seems to be correlative to insight problem solving. That's, that's the point of this. Um, so again, I, I mentioned that uh, the training that you received in shaping and modulating your attention probably consisted of somebody yelling at you, saying, pay attention. Uh, but there actually does seem to be some training that you can do. And hopefully you got some of it. Maybe if you did sort of like high level sports or music or something like that, or meditation. Uh, so meditation, training in meditation seems to help facilitate, facilitate insight problem solving. Uh, and particularly what they tested was what's called uh, mindfulness meditation. It's kind of the bog standard form of meditation that they teach. And it involves breaking frame in a certain way. Uh, and it also involves a transparency opacity shift. So, uh, so what you do when you're, you're doing standard mindfulness meditation is you pay attention to the sensations of your breath. And typically you're looking through these sensations. 
you're trying to, you're regulate, so you're doing things like paying attention, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, you're paying attention to like, am I out of breath? Am I really excited? Am I uh, really bored? Am I almost asleep, right? That's looking through those sensations to monitor your internal state. Yeah? Is there any metric for being like good at meditation? Uh, you can, well, Um, there's various ways, there are various things you can test. The goal of meditation is a highly contentious issue. So it kind of depends on what tradition you're from and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, you can measure a bunch of things about people's meditation practice and use that as correlative. Uh, I don't, in this experiment, I don't think that they measured how good they are at meditating. Uh, Zen people think that there's no such thing as good at meditation. So, but in this case, they just had them either, they had them either do some meditating or some other task, some relaxation task. So the typical thing, if you're doing an experiment on meditation, the typical thing is have somebody meditate, follow the breath versus have somebody just do a relaxation, like listen to the sounds of the ocean and just kind of chill. Uh, and that's the kind of like comparison group. So in this case, they either had them do some meditation, mindfulness meditation or a relaxation task and then insight problem solving. And they found that the people who did the meditation were better at insight problem solving. Why? So the thing that you do when you're uh, doing mindfulness meditation, you're paying attention to your breath, which is something that your brain mostly doesn't wanna do because you're not getting a whole lot of valuable information out of it, right? What your brain wants to do is run around the world and solve your problems. Oh, I need to do laundry. So you, you try to do this. You try to sit there and just breathe naturally and pay attention to the sensations in your breath. I was, the way I was taught was in just kind of in your abdomen. You're just paying attention to the sensations in your abdomen and your brain immediately wants to go, Fuck, I, did I do my laundry? Uh, oh, I said something mean to her. Oh, I feel bad about that. Oh man, I wonder what, what's on TV tonight. Like that's, the, that's immediately what your mind wants to do is not look at your sensations, but look through them to the world. And you just, the training is just bringing it back over and over and over again. Trying to train your ability to pay, to make your sensorial experience opaque. That is pay attention to, so in the tapping task, this was when you're paying attention to the sensations in your fingers rather than trying to probe the object. Your brain wants to solve problems. It wants to deal with external threats it wants to look through your sensations. What you're doing in meditation is training it to look at your at your sensations. Um, so, spoiler alert, I'm gonna make the case later in this. I'm sorry, that's an obnoxious thing to say. Here's how this lecture is gonna end. It's not just uh, breaking frame that's helpful, it's making frame as well, which is one of my critiques of modern mindfulness meditation is that all they're teaching you is how to do the transparency to opacity shift. And in most traditional meditation practices, there is a opacity to transparency shift in the sense that, so uh, the one I have most experience with is the Vipassana tradition, where they teach you this breaking your sensations down to the smallest possible parts thing, but they also teach you loving kindness meditation where you reach out with your heart and, and spread love and compassion to all, being, all sentient beings. And that's the opposite of breaking things down into their smallest possible parts. And those two practices balance each other in important ways. So if you're just doing a mindfulness course at your office for professional development day, you're doing one half of meditation, but not the other half. And they really need each other in important ways. Just, okay. Okay, so, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Would it be accurate to say transparency is to opacity as is mindfulness to unconscious? That's interesting, yeah. So when you're seeing something transparently, you're seeing through it and you're not conscious of it. So what you're doing, when you're doing a transparency opacity shift, you're shifting what you're conscious of. So that seems right to me, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Hypothetically. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, uh, is my experience of that guiding my attention or am I being traumatized kind of aware? Like I'm trying I'm trying to get the, the disconnection between memory mm. and like my attention for something. Whew. 
Okay, that's a, that's a deep and difficult, difficult question that I don't feel qualified to answer. Um, can you, okay. I, I can still care, I can still direct my attention to something, but I also have that kind of mental safety check of, look, if I do this, I'm gonna get smacked with a wooden spoon. Right, not right. So there's some, okay, so here's, here's what I do feel qualified to say. Uh, what you find relevant is not a purely voluntary affair. Um, what you find relevant can often be out of your hands. It's not just you can just decide what you care about. And early life experiences have a huge impact on what we care about, right? If you've had, a, if you've had like, and it seems like early life experience has long-term effects on what you're going to find relevant. So uh, if you've had a, if you've had a, a certain type of traumatic experience, like if you have a car crash, uh, here's one that I've actually experienced. If you had a car crash, car crashes are going to really loom large in your mind for a long time. Uh, you're going to have that. You might even, you might, I had, I had flashbacks of my car crash. I would just be sitting there and go, <gasps> and I could feel the moment before the impact, right? So like, that's going to jump out at you. Uh, so what, what, you, what you care about, what's relevant to you, is by no means a thing that you can just voluntarily, here's what I care about. Uh, and sometimes you might not like what you care about. Sometimes you might wish that you could change that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, there are some techniques for doing that, but like, by no means do we have anything like fully voluntary control. So yeah. So kind of like the attention in which, which is still based on relevancy that yeah. I apply to what I find relevant. Yeah. Uh, well, you can shape it. You can shape it. Uh, it's not that it's completely out of our control either. Uh, so you can, there's, so one of the, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So one of the reasons why uh, meditation is recommended is that it helps you uh, so what, after I had a car crash, my attention was automatically vividly drawn to that experience. And one of the things you can do in meditation is train your attention to be less automatic. And that's why it's good for insight problem solving is because the problem with an insight problem is that you automatically frame something in some way, just like with the, with the cards. So you've automatically gestalted. You often in insight problems automatically gestalted in a way that frustrates your ability to solve the problem. So doing things like training and meditation can help you de-automatize your attention, right? It can help you do things like make your reactions less automatic. So you know, with kind of respect to your, your car crash scenario, like yeah. how are you using your attention to determine that your attention is shaped by your car crash? By using metacognition, your ability to monitor your own attention. And that's for almost everybody who starts to learn meditation, I'm sorry, this is turning into a meditation ad. We'll all stop doing this soon. Uh, almost everybody who starts, who starts meditation finds that the first skill they need to train is the question of where, where is my attention right now? So you're like, okay, I'm gonna pay attention to the breath now. And then five minutes later, you're like, wow, I'm thinking about high school again. And you didn't even notice. You didn't even notice that your mind had wandered off for a really long time. And then the skill that you need to train is notice when your attention has wandered off. Okay, okay, let's, okay, let's move on from this. Right, so here's another one, another uh, transparency opacity shift. The Stroop effect, the Stroop task. This is the most studied effect in psychology. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of this. So I want you to tell me what color the top word is. Not the, not the content, but the literal color of the letters. And yeah, and what you want to go is blue, right? Because what you want to do, what, you're, what you've been training to do for practically your whole life is not to look at words, it's to look through words, 
Hello. Is this is this a place people hang out during? There's a lot of people because of uh, graduation. Ah, thank you. I was wondering why everybody's so fancy out there. Yeah. So many well-dressed people. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Congratulations to all of the graduating class. Right. So the thing that you, you've been training to do is not to look at words, but to look through words to their meaning. This is a very automatic response, right? This is like, if you had to parse out the visual shape of the words every time, you'd be a very, very slow reader. If you're a quick reader, what you do is just see the meaning of the sentence. The meaning is what appears in your conscious experience, not the shape or color of the letters. Yeah. Oh, right. Like the beginning part and the end part are the way they're supposed to. You can read through a paragraph with huh. no huh. I don't know if they're related. I don't know if they're related. I don't want to, I don't want to speculate, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so this effect is extremely robust. Uh, it's extremely robust. You cannot placebo your way out of it. So you tell people, you give some, most effects, if you give somebody a pill and tell them with an authoritative voice that it'll help, it'll help. That's why you have to do a placebo controlled trial for even the most, even like more, like heavy opiates have to have a placebo control because you, if you tell people this is, a, this is an opiate, they'll, they'll have pain relief. It, but you can't placebo your way out of this. You can't belief your way out of it. You can tell somebody you're gonna be great at this and then they're not. Uh, so it's a really, really robust effect. Uh, so robust that they use this to detect spies during the Cold War. So you'd give them a bunch of words written in, for the Americans, would give people a bunch of words written in Russian, and then ask them to tell you what the color of the words are. And if you know Russian, there's gonna be a delay. If you don't know Russian, you don't get the delay because you can't see through the words, right? There's no transparency opacity shift. This, seriously, this, is, this, this was one of the ways that they tried to detect. Yeah, I know it's hard for you all to imagine a world in which Russia is our enemy in the world <laughs> stage, but. Okay, so, uh, so this is another case where teaching somebody meditation, you can actually get improvement on the Stroop effect. So meditation seems to, to train, specifically mindfulness meditation, where you're doing this uh, transparency to opacity shift people are more able, and this is what this task involves, right? It involves not resisting the automatic temptation to read through to the meaning of the words, treat the words transparently and get at the juicy meaning inside and actually treat them opaquely and look at the surface form of the word. And that's what mindfulness meditation is. And it seems to improve people's ability to do this. So that's neat. That seems to be a evidence that people are able to train the ability to do transparency opacity shifts voluntarily. Okay. There's that. Yeah. And what about people that are just good at it without training? Um, so there's gonna be natural variation in how good you are at this sort of standardly, yeah. I mean, that's, given, given any ability, there's typically a normal variation in how, how good people are at it. Um, There seems to be uh, so some connection with uh, the autism spectrum and the ability to do this. So people who are high on the autism spectrum seem seem to be more able to attend to the uh, oh, so seem to be able to attend to the features better. So you know the top word it's got this feature of being blue. And if you're high on the autism spectrum, you're, e you're more easily able to attend to the blueness rather than reading through to the meaning. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's gonna be wide natural variations in any, of, in any of these things. Yeah. Okay. Good with that. Good. Okay, here's another one. So this is, this is about, um, so we've been doing transparency opacity. Let's go back to uh, construal level, parts and holes. So, uh, Gunther argues for a representational change theory of insight. So, uh, and what he says is this is, a, this is a good life lesson as well. 
Experience is both a help and a hindrance. So you have, the more experienced you are, remember we said about skill building, well, the better you get at something, the more transparent it becomes to you, the more automatic it becomes, and that's kind of the way you want it. You want to be able to progress from beginner to advanced, and that usually means having the skill come automatically to you. Uh, but automatic, doing things automatically can reduce your ability to do insight problem solving. So he thinks, uh, Gunter argues that insight has two parts. Ch what he calls chunk decomposition and constraint relaxation. So let's, let's talk about those two terms. So a chunk in psychology is a, it's, it's a very unesthetic word. Anyway, it's a meaningfully integrated unit, yeah? Uh, a chunk is a meaningfully integrated unit. So if you know room numerals, the top left thing in there, is that a four? It's a four, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, that's a chunk. Chunk decomposition means taking a chunk out apart into its parts. So it's, it's construal level stuff, it's uh, breaking frame, it's breaking things down into their parts. Uh, <clears throat> so a t Gunter argues, or distinguishes between two kinds of things, uh, two kinds of chunks. A tight, what he calls a tight chunk, a chunk made up of non-meaningful units, like I, V, or X. So in Roman numerals, the X is 10, but if you take away one of the letters, you just get a slanted letter that doesn't mean anything, right? So for it to be a meaningful unit, you need both of its parts, yeah? So that's a tight chunk because its parts don't come apart easily. Contrast that with a loose chunk that is, you know, uh, two, four, seven, eight. So if you take away, you know, if you take away the V in four, you get one. If you take away the one, you get five. So both of those subunits are themselves meaningful units. Uh, so his hypothesis was that people will find it harder to decompose tight chunks, chunks which don't have themselves meaningful units, than they will uh, loose chunks, chunks which are composed of themselves meaningful units. Okay, so that's chunks. That's half of it, and just, yeah, he did, he did find this. People were more fluidly able to break down. This, by the way, the task here was uh, to describe the task. These are equations, and your job, I believe, is to move, is it just one, I think it's just one matchstick to make the equation into a true equation. So right now, this is three equals three plus three, and that's false. Yeah, that's false, okay? Uh, and if you can, you can move, but you, however, you can move one matchstick to make it true. I don't, I don't remember what the answer is, so if you, if you got it, you're smarter than I am. Yeah? For, for the first one, you can just shift the matchstick to make it six. Oh yeah, yeah, six equals three plus three, very good, yeah? Similarly for a second, when you just take one master and join it to the other, and it looks like six, I guess. I don't know. You make a B on the bottom. You make a B on the bottom. On the left hand side, there's three lines, so you take a little line I think you can only move one. Yeah, so you can move one of the three, one of the sticks to make it, make the other single stick to B. Okay. Or you can just put any one of the sticks across the equal sign to make it not equals. Haha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. Who does it doesn't. For our purposes, the actual answer don't doesn't matter too too much. Um, just just getting that the uh, so solving these are insight problems in the sense that it's not obvious what the move to make is right. It's not obvious what the relevant move is, and when you see the answer, you see it all at once. There's no incremental step-by-step -step process for finding this. I think probably if you, if you measured whether people laugh when they hear the solution to it, in, laughing and groaning when you hear the solution seems to be indicative of an insight problem. People are either angry at you or think it's funny. Um, okay, so you got this one hypothesis. Let's talk about constraint relaxation, right? Because this, this, this uh, experiment has both of the parts of insight what we've been describing as insight problem solving. So constraint relaxation is an automatic assumption, right? It's a thing that you've automatically brought to bear. It's the way you frame the problem. 
uh, and constraint relaxation is de-automatizing your assumptions. So here assumptions include things like operators can't be arbitrary, deleted, or changed, or that equations won't have the form x equals x, right? You, you're used to seeing equations that have different things on both sides of them, right? So uh, if you change an equation to just be the same on both sides, it's one way of solving this type of problem. Okay, so that's constraint relaxation. I hope it's, uh, I hope you can see the connection between constraint relaxation and breaking frame doing this transparency opacity shift. So a constraint is just an automatic assumption that you, you're used to making about the problem, about the problem formulation. And constraint relaxation is just de-automatizing those assumptions, bringing those things that you used to see through into conscious awareness so that you can interrogate them. Uh, and kind of unsurprisingly, they found that the more chunk decomposition and constraint relaxation people needed to do, the harder these problems were to solve for them. So what, the, what the, the structure of the experiment was, give them various problems that they thought were involved more chunk decomposition and constraint relaxation. And the more of those two things the problem involved, the harder it was for people to solve them. So that's supposed to be evidence that these are two parallel things that you need to be doing to solve insight problems. Yeah? Okay. Right. I'll do another. Let's do another. All right. So uh, McCaffrey did this fun thing. Uh, so here's the problem. You got a candle, a one by one inch metal cube, and two metal rings. Using those two things together, figure out how to fix the rings together so you can't pull them apart easily. Okay, and he either did or didn't teach people at the same time as giving them this problem the following skill. Take any object and try to re-describe it in as meaningless, as functionless terms as you possibly can. And take any object and describe it in terms of its parts. So. What are the parts of a candle? The wax and the wick. What's a, the wick, however, is a functional description. A wick is something that you use to burn down. What's a meaningless, a less functional description? String. So how do you attach the two rings together given that you have a piece of string? You tie them together with the string. Okay. So, this is about breaking down what they call functional fixation. So you think, you look at a candle and you think, it's a candle. There's a piece of wick in it and the wick is for burning. And uh, that's, that's a good thing to think, right? You want, you want to be able to think of the world in those terms, in functional terms. But if you want to solve insight problems, the thing you have to be able to do is to A, be able to think about things in terms of their parts and B, to de-automatize the assumptions that you have about what those parts are for, right? So you think of the wick as a string with all the properties of string, like being able to tie things together, rather than as a wick, which is only for burning. Yeah? So again, we've got, we've got these two things that we've been talking about all along. So this, uh, on this axis, we've got the transparency opacity shifts, and we've got construal level shifts. Two different dimensions along which your attention has to be dynamically updated as necessary. Okay. But there's something my, at least mildly disturbing going on here. Because I've been telling you that, you know what's great for solving insight problems? Scaling down, seeing things in terms of their parts, right? Going from uh, parts, so going from integrated wholes into parts. But what did I tell you is predictive of insight problem solving last time? Things like fuzzy image recognition. 
where you got a bunch of unclear parts and what you do is shift to being able to see them as an integrated whole. Yeah? You have no clear kind of correlation or description of what parts we have and what parts we can create? That's absolutely right. That's, a, that's absolutely right. We haven't formalized that process, no. Uh, I think there's a deeper problem here in what I've been telling you, or at least something that we need to sort through, which is that it seems like shifting from parts, from holes to parts facilitates insight, and shifting from parts to holes facilitates insight. That seems, that seems at least mildly worrying, right? Cogn cognitive leap, remember cognitive leaping where you get very vague cues and you have to figure out how they come together as a whole? Well, that's shifting from parts to holes, isn't it? I've been telling you, but, but I've been telling you that shifting from holes to parts is how you solve in insight problems. So insight requires insight. Not exactly, not exactly. Well, I mean, oh, okay, are you making a pun? Is that what's happening here? No. Okay. <laughs> It's, no, it's, it's not a homunculus. This time it's not a homunculus. This time it's not a homunculus. Okay. But that was a good guess. Okay. So here's another one. Another sort of like to complicate this picture a little more. So uh, you show people some faces and either have them describe those faces or just do nothing. And then they do the distractor task. And then they have to do a facial recognition task to recognize the faces afterwards. And people who are asked to describe the faces actually did worse on facial recognition. So let's, I mean, okay, maybe it's a, it's a mild stretch to call facial recognition an insight problem, but you do have to like put it together that that's who that, you know, I see that person. You have to see through the features of the face to their collective identity, something like that. So what do you do when you ask somebody to describe somebody's face? What are you doing to them? You're driving them to the level of features, right? You're saying, I need you to tell me the shape of their nose and the shape of their mouth and the shape of their head, right? So you're driving people to the featural level and by driving them to the featural level, instead of when I, like, I probably couldn't describe to you my sister's face just off the top of my head. I would recognize her, I promise you that, but I probably couldn't describe it in detail. What I do when I recognize somebody's face is just see it as a whole, right? You see it as an as a integrated unit. And when you ask somebody to describe a person's face in detail, you're driving them to the featural level and it actually impedes their ability to put that face together as an integrated unit. They do worse at this task. So, construal level shifts from holes to parts inhibit problem solving. What? What? There's another one. Same facial recognition task but instead of having people describe faces, they just prime them by having them look at these Navon letters and asking them to look at the small letters that they're composed of. So again, you're driving people down to the feature level processing. And again, that inhibits their ability to do the gestalt and property, gestalt and property processing that seems to be required for problem solving and insight. What? So what I've shown you so far is that going from parts to holes helps and hurts, and going from holes to parts helps and hurts. We give up and cry. Uh, okay, not really, not really. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's a, I think that's a, a very apt metaphor. We should think in terms of imponent processing. There's a constant back and forth between scaling up, scaling down, transparency to opacity, and opacity to transparency. Uh, and what we need in order to successfully solve insight problems, you might say, is a, uh, 
it's a phase function fit. Let's call it that. Phase function fit. So the phase of problem solving that you're in needs to fit the functionality that you bring to bear of it, right? So when is it appropriate to break a hole into its parts? Probably when you're doing the initial phase of problem solving where you're like, okay, you've given me this thing and I'm gonna look at its parts, try to understand them, try to do that left brain linear processing, right? And then you get stuck and it's probably time for a transparency to opacity shift and maybe a shift from parts to gestalt, from parts to whole. And then if you find a problem formulation that might work, then you shift back. You go back from seeing the problem opaquely to occupying a problem formulation transparently and you start working on the parts again. So it's neither going one direction or the other that helps us solve these problems. It's doing the right kind of move at the right moment, dynamically, flexibly, intelligently. And yeah, that, that means that what we haven't done is provided a formal analysis of this yet. What we've done is really just characterize the phenomena. Yeah. So basically you're coming back to the fact that you're choosing which focus is relevant. Exactly. Exactly. You need to find the relevant level of construal and the relevant object to make opaque to solve your problem. Uh, sorry. Well, it's the metacognition that we use to guide our cognition. So you have to be smart about being smart. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Touche. Yeah, I mean, Can you say more about your meh? Uh, so we need metacognition to, to allow us to, to guide our attention. It, you just, you're just shifting it. Kind of. Okay, so... I'm absolutely not saying I've given you an, an, a formal analysis of how we do that. That's so, that's, you're, if you're like, you haven't given us the whole story yet, I, I agree completely. Okay. Do you agree that we do need metacognition? Yes. Okay, good, good. That seems to me in, almost indisputable that we need to be thinking about thinking at least some of the time. Um, you need to be monitoring your own process for things like, am I failing in this problem formulation? Like how good is my how good is my problem solving going at this moment? And if it's going disastrously, that's your signal to change the way you formulated the problem, and that's a metacognitive ability. Yeah. If we're going off of I know, uh, another person kind of thought about that, we're always it's always just a degree of transparency when you're uh, dealing with like a particular issue. Could you could you look at it then as a, we're always at all times? Like it, it's not a different function to look at to to look at something transparently or to mm. see it as okay. It's, you're kind of just ad adjusting the degree to to allow you to solve the problem. I, I don't see any problem with that. Yeah. So probably when you're doing that tapping task, you weren't completely unaware of the probe in your hand. You're, you're tapping away. This is your probe. This is your object. Um, and I gave you instruction. Try to in investigate the object really had no, not zero attention in your probe. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's just, I, so I take it that you can talk about this stuff in degrees and that's probably okay. And with the degree that you would be able to focus, would the limit then be the meaning of a particular object as a whole? You mean like what's the, what's the end point of opacity? Yeah, how opaque can something be? Um, oh, it's just when you're trying to, I mean, it, it can get opaque enough that you're uh, gaining information about it. So when something is opaque, what you're doing is training your attention on learning its properties. So its opacity is probably, I don't know, it's an interesting question. I don't know what the limit point of opacity is. It's just when it's the thing that you feel you're in contact with or something like that. That's not a very satisfying answer, I recognize that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I would say, like, for the example again, like speech. Yeah. It yeah. Seems like most that I could, I could focus on would be the meaning of the words that you use. Um, it, seems, it seems hard to imagine. I mean, meaning what? Home? you could you could ask about my so 
You could be listening to my words in the sense of trying to extract their meaning for understanding the material in class. You could go deeper than that and ask, why is it he's presenting this material rather than some other material? What political undertones are racing through the material such that he's trying to indoctrinate this to his weird worldview? I mean, you can, you can ask about the rhetorical techniques that I'm using. So you need to understand the meaning of my words to understand the rhetorical techniques. So you go look past the literal meaning to like, how is he using language to do this stuff? So there's, I don't know, there's layers and layers. It's platonic forms is the answer. That's the, that's the limit of opacity. That's, I don't, I made that up. That doesn't, that's not a real answer. Okay, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. For me, this problem seems to be easier to understand if um, made into like an intuition problem. Mm. So mm. our intuition seems to put us in a well, starting spot, whether it's a whole or a part, but we, we have to, one way or another, you know, keep our intuition system in check. Right. Right. So, wh what is intuition? Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, one way of thinking about intuition is that it's imp uh, implicit learning. Like automatic. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's learning that you don't realize that you're doing. So when you, uh, there's a good there's a good book called Educating Intuition, uh, which describes possibly how intuition works, and it's basically like when you've got when you've got unconscious learning going on, you're building up your intuition for a, for a situation. Um, yeah, so that's probably right. And it's probably right that, so if, it, if the process of doing an attentional shift is automatic, then it's certainly something that's unconscious. So you've got an intuition about when it's, when it's going on. So that's, that's probably right. It's not, just like the things that I'm saying, it's maybe not satisfying as a formal account, um, but that sounds, it sounds about right to me anyway. Yeah. So from, at the beginning of the class, we said that we wanted to analyze formal and mechanize. That'd be great. It would be a huge problem if huh. you're trying to mechanize this, right? Because then hmm. um, you're shifting from automatic to less automatic gears, and then you're deciding when to do that, and then relevance comes into that. So is that part of the problem, or would you say, or... I, yeah, so I, I think we, we won't know how to mechanize this until we've at least got it analyzed and formalized, probably. Um, and currently we don't know how to, well, there's some, I'll show you some work on potentially how we could analyze and formalize this. Uh, and it seems to have to do with the structure of consciousness itself. So once we've got a good analysis of consciousness, we'll, have a, we'll potentially have an analysis of conscious attention, and then we can analyze and formalize this stuff. Uh, it's hard to say what counts as automatic in a machine, right? So what is, what is automatic in a machine? Kind of everything, kind of nothing. Okay, okay, okay. Let's take a break. Uh, let's take 10 minutes. I haven't got tons and tons to, do, to go, but a uh, couple more experiments and some wrap up stuff and some like perspective stuff about where we're going. So come back at uh, 3.15 and we'll finish off. Okay, so we were talking about uh, opponent processing in the sense of You've got uh, a draw towards the parts, a draw towards the whole. You've got a draw towards seeing things transparently, seeing them opaquely. And that these things are kind of always in a dynamic tension, flipping between one and one or the other, hopefully appropriately in the situation that you, you've got going on. Uh, now, I want to bring this back just to finish off to the debate between the search inference framework and the gestaltists. This debate that we've been talking about for some time between this being an inferential skill and a procedural skill. So you're tempted probably to ask, okay, what's the rule by which I decide inferentially to do a transparency opacity shift or a part whole shift? And I want to sort of finish this off by making the case that it's much more like a procedural skill than a rule-based inference. So let me just show you one example from this, actually two experiments. This is the weird, this is weird. I find this very weird. So uh, they had people do the Dunker radiation problem. So they had some people in, you recall from last time, this is the one you have to figure out that you're gonna send three beams in through to not destroy the healthy tissue. And they track their eye movement. So people, they track the eye movements of people who are trying to solve this and just around this shape. And they followed 
all everybody's, but then if you were successful, they said, okay, you're part of the group that solved this thing. They stored your eye movement patterns. And they had another group come in, try to solve the problem. But what they did was have them, the eye movements of the successful people were reproduced in a little X moving around the diagram. And they said, just watch the X. Just watch the X. And that had a significant facilitation for people to solve the Dunker radiation problem. They didn't give them any hints. They didn't tell them the answer in any way. They didn't give them any propositions. They just said, follow the X. And that's an intentional thing, right? What you're doing is moving your attention through the space. And I promise you it didn't draw like three straight lines through the thing, right? It wasn't a visual representation of the solution. It was just there was some attentional pattern that correlated with solving this thing and showing it to people seemed to help them solve the problem. Yeah? The, the people who solved it didn't all have the same That's right. So did they take like the average of their, did they show different? I believe they showed different ones. Yeah. I, I don't remember exactly, but I, I believe they showed them just like a variety of different Was successful. I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah, they don't. It's hard to represent a pattern of eye movement like in a paper. So I, I don't think they gave me the exact eye movements. Those are good questions, but I don't recall. Yeah. Yeah. So that's bizarre and weird. Here's another slightly weirder wrinkle on this thing. Um, you can do what's called um, uh, covert attention. So I can fix my eyes like on this table, but I can watch what he's doing without looking at him. So if you wave, I'll be able to see it. Yeah, look, I see. So covert attention. You have somebody fix their eyes right in the middle and just watch the same thing. The X moves around the space. So it's not even about reproducing the eye movements. They're just paying attention to this X as it moves around the space. The movement of their attention seemed to help them solve the problem. Yeah. What if you describe the per problem verbally instead of perceptually like this? How well, they did, they did verbally describe You have to give them the instructions for the problem first. Yeah, what, if, what if you did that without showing them the picture? Um, I think that makes it harder for them to solve, what, what I believe. If, like, if, if we're seeing or our attention is kind of guide around or perceptually, we can brace our eyes, is there a way to kind of guide our, our verbal analysis or something? Like, yeah, I mean, with the puzzle versions of the problems we saw last time, that's a way of guiding people. Yeah. Okay. But, but even when they gave them the, the cues or the hints to the problems, they, in many cases, still failed. Yeah. So in this case, like, you're, you're showing that. Like, they still, many people failed. But you're saying more of them pass? Yeah, you show them the eye movements, more of them pass. Yeah. So perceptual cues are better than verbal cues? That seems to be it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, this is just one last, I, hopefully I've given you a whole bunch of evidence for this insight as a procedural ability rather than an inferential process. And that might worry you because you might think that what we do with our brains is inference, right? Um, but I would like to very briefly kind of foreshadow what's gonna come in the next semester. So obviously Thursday we're gonna do the test. After that, we're gonna start in, in the history of AI. And the history of AI is gonna go through, start from, actually we're gonna start really, we're gonna start from Aristotle. It's like a really early history of AI. But uh, once we get into like the modern 20th century history of AI, it's gonna be assumed for a really long time that the way you build an artificial intelligence machine is to build an inference machine. Build a computer with logical rules programmed into it. And we're gonna see that program have some success, it's gonna come up with a bunch of problems, and the kind of uh, third wave of this stuff, the kind of current thinking on it, is that it's actually more like a dynamic, what's called a dynamical system. So we're gonna come near the end of the AI section into this dynamical systems discussion. So uh, what is a dynamical system? It literally just means any system that changes over time. So that's pretty broad. Uh, but they have more specific things in mind when they talk about dynamical systems. So uh, 
it might not be the case that your brain calculates in an abstract symbolic way when it's time to scale up or scale down, when it's time to make something transparent or opaque. It might be the case that there's just a bunch of dynamical constraints operating in a mutually uh, inter interacting manner. So I wanna give you the classic example of that, which is this is a picture of a watt governor, a watt governor. And a watt governor has a very important balancing task to perform. It keeps a train moving at a constant speed. That's the job of a watt governor. And here's how it does it. It doesn't do the following. It doesn't say, if 64 miles per hour, then increase throttle by 3%. If 65, then keep equal. It doesn't do inferences. It doesn't have rules built into it. What it's got is the following. It's got a flywheel. So this thing rotates around, right? And those two weights, as it's rotating around, those two weights are lifted up by centrifugal force, right? So they're kind of pulled out. Now, the faster it rotates, the further those balls are raised up, okay? And that moves a lever which throttles down the amount of steam going from the engine to the drivetrain, okay? So the further these balls are raised, the faster it's going, the, fur the further the balls raise up and it goes slower, which means the balls go back down. So this is, this is driven by the wheels of the train. Right? The rotation of this is driven by how fast the wheels are actually going. And so the faster the wheels are going, the more it raises the balls up and drops the throttle down. Now, if it goes too slow, the balls go down, right? The, the wheels make this thing rotate slower, the balls go down, and it throttles up, making it go faster. So it achieves this dynamic equilibrium between opening and closing the throttle, and then the wheels going faster and slower, causing the train to move at a constant speed. And what I would like you to notice about this is that there's nobody thinking through, oh, I'm not going quite fast enough, I need to go faster. There is nobody inferentially working through the steps, the logical steps of deciding when it's time to throttle up or throttle down. It's too, dynamical systems, the wheels of the train and the walk governor, and the three, the engine, all mutually constrain each other in a continuous dynamical fashion. Yeah? Yeah, I did. Do you think this is doing inferences? No, but okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, using language. I'm, I'm not using a dynamical system to talk to you. So I have to use language to describe it. But the system, it's, I hope you agree that the system itself is not thinking about velocity at all. The system itself is just finding a balance. It's a, it's a finding a dynamical balance without having to think through anything. But it's, it's working with respect to momentum, gravity, and rules. There's, there's a check going on. Like, if I'm going faster, I'm going faster. Well, there are laws... There are laws of nature, but those are not inferential rules. Yeah? Okay. Yeah? I'm just wondering, like, I understand that you're using this example for the train, but wasn't this first um, coined for um, the development of planes? And, like, not planes like this, oh. plane, but like planes like aircraft? Um, no, I believe this was developed in the 1800s before there were planes. So it was, it was developed by James Watt, I believe, in the late 1800s, and the first planes were in the early 1900s. We can, we can Wikipedia this, if, we, if you like. I, I'm, I just remember this structure specifically doing the same thing that you're, you're speaking about. For planes. Or maybe, yeah. you know what? It might be the, a dropping of the wheels of a plane that causes the right. chugging. Right, 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 right. That's possible. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a good design and it's applicable all over the place, so it's quite possible it was also used in a variety of places. Okay, the point, the point is, this thing is not doing calculations. 
the watt governor doesn't calculate the right speed and the right amount of throttle to get that speed. That would be a very difficult and like fast paced calculation, especially for the kind of computers that you had in the 1800s, which were people with pens and papers, right? That's the, what, when you say a computer in the 1800s, you mean somebody with a pen. You don't, so this, a, a modern computer can do this, that's fine. But this is a thing, is a, it's a dynamical system that does it without calculating. And the basic thesis that we're gonna look at late in the AI section next, uh, in the next section is maybe we're like that too. Okay, so, but it's not just any kind of dynamical system. So again, dynamical system is a very broad category of system. Lots and lots of dynamical systems. Some of them, I mean, we thought this up, right? Somebody actually designed this. Somebody built it with that specific goal in mind. James Watt very cleverly put this together. And presumably that doesn't describe us. Unless, uh, right? So we need something, another layer in this theory and the next layer is something like talking about self-organization. So a self-organizing dynamical system is one that comes to a kind of orderly state without anybody having imposed that orderly state on it. It comes to order, so, and this is kind of 20th century thinking about the physical world. For a really long time it was assumed that if there's anything orderly, it must have been somebody who imposed that order on it. But it turns out there's lots of systems that just spontaneously, emer from which order spontaneously emerges. Let me show you my favorite example of this. So here is spontaneous synchronization. These are metronomes set to about the same uh, ticking rate. This is about a minute long, so. There's disorder at the moment. But these things are coupled together, right? That's why it's on the soda cans, so that their, their movement can influence each other. And very quickly, spontaneous order will emerge. I love it. I just love this. There you go. So that's a really simple example of spontaneous or self-organization. Um, you know, UCA Department of Physics and Astronomy. That's where this YouTube video came from. Uh, oh boy. We do not want to autoplay my YouTube queue. That's more, that's more intimate than I expected this lecture to be. Okay, so, uh, okay, so we got this theory of dynamical systems. This is theories, uh, systems that change smoothly, continuously over time. And we've got this theory of self-organizing dynamical systems where there's nobody, so with those metronomes, nobody told them which, how to organize each other, like how to come to an organized state. It wasn't imposed from without, and probably you couldn't have predicted ahead of time whether they'd all be going this way at a given time or all this way at a given time, right? They kind of come to a compromise where they organized each other. Order arose spontaneously from the parts. So with all of these deep inferential problems, like how do you solve the relevance problem? How do you figure out like without doing an inferential search through all of the possibilities, which we know is incredibly difficult, how does the solution just emerge out of the system? And thus the, the dynamical self-organizing systems perspective suggests that it's something that can just, without having a top-down, like somebody deciding ahead of time, here's the rules, here's how it's gonna work out, some systems can organize themselves from the bottom up and come to an orderly solution spontaneously. That's gonna be the way that I'm gonna propose that we can represent things like skillful behavior. So obviously there's something in us that's able to do math, right, and logic, and inferences, and language, and all that stuff. But there seems to also be something in us that can do this incredibly skillful, like mutual constraint satisfaction, 
you can do these dynamic things like catch a ball and like, you know, like decide when to do a transparency opacity shift that are skills rather than inferences. And the account that seems to make the most sense, at least to me, of how we do that stuff is this dynamical self-organizing stuff. So rather than trying to build AI, so we're gonna look at the attempts to build AI in purely rule-based terms, and we're gonna see that it doesn't work out. It doesn't really pan out as a strategy. And then we're gonna to start to look at where it's going now, which is more in the direction of spontaneous dynamical self-organization. So that's where we're gonna go. That's where this stuff about attention and construal kind of leads us to thinking that what we need is some account of our skills rather than our inferences. And this is probably gonna be a good way of thinking about that. Yeah? This would be akin to designing a sandbox in which things can come out of that sandbox in various phases and features and sizes. Yep. I still have to define the limits and still have to lay down some kind of rules to hold my sandbox. I still have to That's right. Yep, yep. Well, the, the, as I said, we, we need to be able to do inferences, for sure, because we obviously do inferences, but. I'm just saying by the very nature of even a dynamic system, you need inferences to define the dynamic system. Yeah, but nobody had to make inferences to define. Assuming that we evolved, nobody, rather than we're, if God made us, then God needed to do some inferences. But if we just evolved, we existed before inferences, so. I'm with you on that, but then. Okay. In a sense, but it's a dynamical rule rather than, and we'll talk extensively about evolution actually. It's a dynamical rule rather than an inferential rule. Okay, really quickly, seems like insight's a lot more like perceptual procedural skill than it is an inferential process. It involves shifting attention around by scaling up, scaling down, seeing through, looking at, and I've hinted that that might be a process that's best understood in terms of dynamical systems rather than symbolic computations. That's the gist of, that's the moral of the story so far. Okay, all right. So, next time the test. Thanks everyone. <laughs>